precious thing that we've got. May the light that you have put in my heart be the light that directs these to our people. So if you go back behind our house, there's an overgrown bank that drops down about 30 feet to nine mile feet. And one section of that bank is mostly entangled with wild grapevines. These are really thick vines. They've been there a long time. Some of them are four to six inches across at the base. They climb most of the trees around them, sending their vines upward so they can gather as much sunlight as possible from the trees which they surround. If you cut one off at the base, you have to cut it again a little further up because the vine divides and will cover engulf more than one tree as it attempts to capture as much sunlight as it can get. It is a constant struggle to keep these wild vines from overtaking all the trees on the bank. And in spite of their aggressive growth, there's still only a few small clusters of wild grapes on the vine. In contrast, if you go west, down Memory Road here, or south from Skidathus on West, West Lake Road, you'll find several cultivated vineyards. They have been established with nice straight trellises, and through careful pruning, the vines will yield lots of grapes in their season. It's those well-placed trellises and carefully pruned vines that bring about a good harvest of grapes. In the Old Testament, the images of grapevines had been used by earlier rabbis and prophets to represent Israel. Israel is a luxurious vine, claims Hosea, that yields its fruit in chapter 10, verse 1. Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel all use the image of a vine to describe the people of God in Israel. Sometimes, as in Jeremiah, the reference is to a vine that has been planted to produce good fruit, but yet has gone wild, producing fruit unfit for nourishment. The image of vines was a long tradition in the mindset of the people of Israel. In John's Gospel, Jesus takes the image of grapevines and presents it a little differently from the older Jewish understanding. Instead of Israel as the vine, Instead of the people of God planted and tended by God, Jesus says, I am the vine. More than that, he says he is the vine, and we are the branches. Now we might think of this as a hierarchical statement, but it makes more sense to see it as a description of role and function. Jesus is the source of sustenance. He is the connection to the root system that keeps us stable and fed and able to tend to the business of the branches, which is to produce fruit. Included within this simple description are some additional devices in the next advice in the next seven verses. Stay connected. Of course, that's the number one um, piece here. Stay connected to the vine, to the source. Without it, 
connection with that is, there will be no fruit. But there's also a warning. Watch out for pruning. Not because of being cut off so much as being left out. Sometimes we read this as judgment, and it is. But the real power of the image is that prune that those branches which are pruned miss the vitality of connection. They miss the fertile life offered. They miss out on the sustenance and strengthening and the glory of growth and life and joy when connected with the source, our source, Jesus. And when you're disconnected from the root source, you miss that opportunity to produce more fruit. That brings us to Acts and Philip. So Philip is staying connected by following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Put yourself in his shoes and imagine being sent forth without any clear direction on the wilderness road. That's where he encounters the Ethiopian eunuch, a court official from Kadas. Candace, Candace, what well, around you say that? Like the queen of the Ethiopians. Now this guy is certainly different than anyone Philip has encountered in his hometown of Bethsaida, or in Jerusalem, or in Samaria. First, the guy is an Ethiopian. The word itself sometimes means burnt face or swarthy face, and is thus taken to re refer to any dark-skinned person. And he's a human, a castrated man, who was an affront to the Jewish community, because they put great emphasis on procreation, and men for procreation and men. So the difference between Philip and the eunuch differences are astronomical. He's a member of the Queen's Court with the rights and authority that go along with such a position. And Philip is just a poor fisherman. As he was traveling, the, the eunuch, because he was traveling to Jerusalem, was likely a proselyte or God-fearer meaning that he is a follower of many Jewish customs and traditions, but still not a member of the Jewish faith. So Philip is directed by the Spirit to join this person in the chair. And the eunuch is reading aloud from Isaiah 57, 53, verses 7 and 8. He asks for help in interpreting the Hebrew Scripture. Philip applies the passage the eunuch is reading to Jesus. His response isn't recorded, but a likely connection would have been the shared shame and rejection suffered by the eunuch. The figure in Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12 is similar to that of the crucified Jesus. Philip goes on to proclaim to him the good news about Jesus. The Ethiopian believes what Philip is teaching him, and when they come upon some water, he stops the chariot and asks Philip to baptize him. Now if you look closely at our scripture reading this morning, you'll notice that there is no verse 37 in, Je in this version of John's Gospel. That's where we find Philip's request, the response to the eunuch's request. Verse 37 in other ancient writings says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What said, if you believe with all your heart, 
you may be baptized. And the unit that lies, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So Philip baptizes him. And they come up out of the water. Suddenly, the Spirit snatches Philip away. And the happy Ethiopian eunuch continues his journey while Philip ends up in Azostas, where he continues to proclaim the good news until he returns to Caesarea. Philip has produced fruit and has continued to be connected to the vine. He was called to produce fruit with the other disciples. In John 15, verses 1 through 8, it was their job, their responsibility, their reason for being. And it was their fulfillment and joy, opportunity, and hope. It was their way of responding to the resurrected Jesus Christ. The Messiah that they love. And in John's the letter, we find more about the story of love for Jesus and God and others. Um, John is the gospel writer and who is considered the spiritual one of the gospels. So, and that story continues here in this letter. So we find out that it's our calling and our privilege to be branches of our Savior's body that will bring glory to God. And that's what John 15, 8 says, hmm, we give glory to God by producing the kind of fruit it says more about who God is than about who we are. By producing the kind of fruit that God calls for rather than the fruit that we might like. That means we need to learn about who God we are. We need to, do, to know who God is and what it is that our God wants before we can bring the offering before we can produce the fruit that will give him glory. We do that by abiding in the body, by dwelling on the words of Jesus until the words of Jesus will become our words, until we will his will, until we are so connected, so much a part of the vine, that it is his blood that courses through our veins. It is his love that causes our hearts to pound. It is his joy that fulfills us. Apart from the body, we wither. And if we stay connected, we will become mature fruit that can pass on this new good news of Jesus Christ to the rest of the world. But when we're cut off from the source, we feel and we are empty. We lack that love by which we could have been filled. And there, then we can produce the fruit that gives God the glory. It's not our will but God's that we strive to do.